Explain. Ex- I'm explaining. I'm explaining. I love <laughs> the like the the hike up, you know, a mountain. It's amazing. You get to experience this whole thing. But man, that destination sometimes is incredible too. And I think people want to say that. I don't know. I have these like mixed feelings about it. Like it's like very clear I do because yes, I love the like the the hiking and the journey and like okay, this is part of it. But sometimes the destination is really rewarding too, and we can't forget that you know that's the final goal. So for me, it's this you know it's a mix of the two worlds, and I think enjoying both to its fullest extent is important. Hello, I'm Alan Hill. In this podcast series of the Nostalgic Vagabond, we're talking travel, all kinds of travel, with all kinds of interesting people from all around the world. In conversation, we'll share personal anecdotes, tales of adventure, and maybe misadventure too. Listen in for some unique cultural perspectives, tips from seasoned veterans, and an array of diverse experiences that have contributed to many life-changing journeys. Travel really is a privilege. We know that now. And if we can't do it right this very moment, let's talk about it then. Hey, where are you right now? On this episode of the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast, I talk with Drea Castro. Drea is an actress, producer, and also a fellow podcaster who was born in the Philippines and now lives in the USA. She loves the great outdoors and uses camping, hiking, and just being in nature as her therapy from her super busy work life in the city. In conversation, we talk about the numerous options that exist within the lower 48 to get out into nature, with Death Valley being an all-time favourite place. And Zion, too. It's the benefits of simplifying life, at least for a few days. Just moving from point A to point B, the decluttering, the decompressing, that Drea knows that she needs to maintain a healthy and creative lifestyle. Drea explains that climbing mountains is something she finds rewarding. Even if she is slow and steady, she'll do her best to make it. She has summited Mount Whitney, which was a highlight, but a low light was a near-death experience walking down the Grand Canyon to the Colorado River back in the day. The crazy things you do when you're young. We talk about whether the journey is more important than the destination. Some of Dre's favourite experiences hiking so far were when both the journey and the destination were awesome in the USA and abroad too. Dre started a podcast during the pandemic like me, and she explains why and how she fits it into her busy schedule at the end of the chat. Hey, listen in for Jimmy the Cricket. Let me know on social media how many times you heard him throw his two cents worth in during the talk. Anyways, let's get to the conversation. All right, here we go. Drea Castro, fellow podcaster and fellow traveler, thanks for coming on the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So are you zooming in from California right now? Yes, from Los Angeles. <laughs> Los Angeles, California. And this is where you work and you've been living there for some years, I understand. Yes, it's been since 2000 and December of 2008, I moved here. Mm. It's crazy, right? No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> and you're involved in the creative business as a lot of people in Los Angeles are. And I understand you're extremely busy right now working on your various creative projects. Today, we're going to talk about outdoor adventures and getting away from the city life and going out and exploring nature and things like this. So my first question to you, Drea, is how do you find time in your busy schedule to get away And then what types of travel adventures do you enjoy? So, like I said, I'm always busy. Like anybody that knows me, I'm always like going from one project to another project and overlapping things and just trying to go from one thing to another. But in order for me to do these things, I have to get away. (laughs) I have to go away and just shut down for a few days, sometimes like a week. Uh, And people know this about me. Otherwise, I can't function creatively. I feel like I'm the best creative person and I can bring a lot more to the table when my brain is shut off and I don't think about anything else except for, you know, camping, road trips, or just just fully getting away. And that's why 
I moved to Los Angeles because it's closer to those things that's so much more accessible than where I was originally, which was New Jersey. Right. It's an easy drive. So I really love the outdoors. And that is l- the exact reason why I moved to Los Angeles, because here you have the ability to go to the mountains and also the desert and then also the ocean. So depending on what your flavor is for the week, you can <laughs> have that option, you know? It's very, very accessible. So I love camping and backpacking and just being outdoors. That's like my my preference for sure. I grew up in Australia. Like California state, there's an abundance of options and diverse countrysides and flora and fauna and landscapes that you can get to within a few hours, let's say, you know, by car. I enjoyed going outdoors when I was growing up. I like to hike into the bush, as we say. I like to go to the beach and walk around the cliff faces and things like that. You said you like to go camping. And and when you say backpacking, do you mean like hiking and trekking through trails? Yes. Yes. I mean, the thing is, I also love international travel. Like I wouldn't mind, you know, going to Europe one day and then backpacking in that way, backpacking that way, Mm. which most people would would understand. But backpacking to me in my present world is putting on, you know, your your sleeping pad, your sleeping bag, your dried food, putting it on your back, 40 pounds and then or 30 to 40 pounds and then hiking into the wilderness for a few miles and then not hearing anything except for the water that you're next to or the trees that you're underneath and all the, you know, the animals around you. That's that's what I just love. I love just zoning out. <laughs> yeah. So is this like a decompression from the stresses and the busyness of your daily life in Los Angeles? Just getting out there, letting nature regenerate your mind, body and spirit? 100%. I find it to be incredibly helpful because, and I talk a lot about this on my podcast because I meet a lot of through hikers and people that are a lot more experienced than than me. <laughs> but it's a matter of survival at that point. You're not thinking about all the noise that you usually think about or this email or this, you know, this thing that you have to get done or for me, this edit I need to get done, et cetera, et cetera. It's just I need to walk (laughs) one foot in front of the other. What do I think about for shelter, food, and water? Mm. And it forces you to go back to the simplest of things, the most primal of needs. It just forces you to do that because you literally have to. There's no other option because you have this, this thing on your back. You have all the weight on your back and you're not, you can't think about anything else because, you know, you're physically being put into that. You're physically being put into the pain of all of that, you know, and uh, that to me is incredibly therapeutic. (laughs) Mm. Yeah. When you've made your life simple for at least a matter of time, how many days typically would you get away from the city and and live simply and, and walk from A to B and just worry about not getting lost, having enough food to eat and water to drink? If I go camping, I usually like to go car camping or... Now I've really discovered the backcountry car camping, which I really like, and that's been really fun. Um, But when it comes to backpacking, the longest I've done is probably like seven days. Mm. And usually that's like in a different country because now I'm like doing like bigger treks. Although now my goal is to really explore California, the Sierras, because there's a lot of amazing backcountry there that you can just take your time and it's so beautiful. And I, it's just in, in my backyard and by backyard, I mean like a four or five hour drive, but that to me is like, so <laughs> yeah. that's so close to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I usually go away if I'm car camping for like maybe three to like five to seven days mm. if I have time. If I have the luxury of time, if not, then usually like three days or something like that. So would you say three days is sort of the minimum amount of time that you would need to decompress and regenerate from the busyness of the city? Yes. (laughs) Yes. So like a long weekend, basically. (laughs) Yes, for sure. Mm. For sure. It's so, so needed. I need it. It's something where I just all of a sudden I can feel my body 
going into a state of like shock from all the stuff I can't think like it's so much harder for me to edit it just takes me so much longer but then when I go away I can come back and I feel so creative and I feel like my whole being is alive again you know because all of it is just so much noise when you're working in entertainment all of it it's just Mm. can be really really difficult so that's my therapy for sure yeah and do you find that you become more creative with having these respite periods or is it just a matter of consistently maintaining a level of creativity in your work and not becoming overwhelmed with so many things going on at once I think it's a little bit of both. I feel like there are times when I feel the latter and there are times when I feel like, you know, I have to get away because otherwise I don't, I don't feel creative anymore. I just feel exhausted and I don't want to get to that point. You know, I don't want to be like, oh my God, I can't Mm. think in front of me. I can't take the first step in front of me because I'm so, you know, I need, I just keep thinking about like nature and then knowing that I'll find inspiration there Mm -hmm. for me. Do you find that you need to schedule in these periods of going away or is it something that you just get to a point in your program and your schedule and you go, no, I need to escape for a few days? I, a lot of times will put it in my schedule, like, okay, I think this weekend, like we're going to go away, you know, or a lot of times our our friends, like I have a big group of nature people (laughs) that love to go camping. They're like my best friends and they'll say, hey, I have this weekend, let's go away. Although it's been a little different this past year. We don't usually get to go out as often as we did because honestly, it was like every camping trip, every outing, it was all of us together. And now, you know, I've kind of had to try to maneuver around that. It's something that I try to schedule in. But then there are times when I'm like very sporadic. And that's when like my emergency bells are going off where it's like, you need to get away. And I'm like, I'm going away this weekend. Goodbye. And like, I just... (laughs) I literally tell all my clients, I'll see you on Monday. Goodbye. You know, and then I just leave on like early Friday or Thursday night and like I just go because it's that means that's like necessary. (laughs) And when you are escaping out into nature, do you find it makes a difference if you go with the group or go solo in terms of that regenerative power? Or do you have a preference if you go with a with a group or on your own? I don't usually go on my own. I usually have, uh, you know, my significant other with me. Mm-hmm. But no, I don't see too much of a difference. I really love my friends. <laughs> I'm very social. So either way, it's just been so helpful. So it doesn't matter if, I'm, you know, it's a smaller, you know, group. If I'm by my, I have gone by myself, you know, that's fine too. But it's like, usually anytime I'm out in nature, I just feel better. You know, I just Mm. do. And it doesn't matter if it's like a big group of, of friends. We all have the same goal. And it's actually so nice when I have like my group with me because it's our, it's my tribe. You know, we're out in the wilderness. We're cooking food together. We're planning meals together. It's this incredible community. And I just feel like they're my family. So it just feels nice. Now, you've been on a bunch of different excursions, I imagine, basing yourself out of Los Angeles. Do you have any particular destinations that you've been to a bunch of times that are like your favorite getaway spots that are relatively close by? And by close, you're talking Three Drea or four close. or five hours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> my Drea close. Most people would be like, are you crazy? No, these are like my, to me, that's close. Um, Death Valley is my favorite. Yeah, Death Valley is probably my most visited park. I fell in love with that park even before I moved here. And that's probably one of the reasons why I moved to Los Angeles. I ended up exploring that park at a time where there wasn't any Instagram or social media. There was just a map and you went, oh, look, it says Death Valley and it's like a green spot. And I think it's a national park. Like, let's drive there, you know, and that's, that's what it was, you know, these places were, were unknown, kind of very desolate. Now it's very different. National parks are packed. It doesn't matter if it's Death Valley, Mm. but Death Valley is amazing because I probably have visited that park over 20 times in the past 13 years, something like that. And yet 
I still haven't explored all of it because it's l- the largest national park in the lower 48 outside of Alaska. So there's just so mm. much to explore. I ended up seeing a new part of it two weeks ago. So it's just constantly, it's just so much exploration. And it's most people stray away from Death Valley because of the name, but it's full of so, it's like, who goes to Death Valley? And I'm like, me, I go there. There's so much, so much to explore. There's the mountains. You can climb the peak up to the top there, uh, the, you know, 11,048 feet above sea level. And you can see the highest mountain in the lower 48 and then the lowest point in North America, which is negative 282. See, I'm like nerding out. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally a nerd about Death Valley. So there's that. And then I also really love Zion. And if anybody has ever gone to Zion, you know why. And Zion's a six and a half to seven hour drive. It's not too bad. <laughs> no, I'm from Australia. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that is not that bad. But living in the UK as I do now, six to seven hour drive is just ludicrous for people in Britain. <laughs> they might not even go for a one hour and a half. But I mean, come on. <laughs> no one does that in England. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I have family there, so yeah, it's not a thing, actually, for most people. That's too far. <laughs> <laughs> Drea, when you're on these getaways, let's call them, and you've simplified your life, you're worried about only having enough food to eat in the day, having enough water to drink, you're getting from A to B on foot. What would you say is the most beneficial thing about just worrying about getting from point A to point B? I think during those times, you have nothing but your thoughts. You know, there's lulls of time when you're not talking to whoever you're with and you're just kind of on your own with your thoughts and you're thinking about, okay, one foot in front of the other, you can do it. And it's very motivating. For me, the things that happen in my brain is, and things that are happening in my brain are all about one foot in front of the other. You can you can do it. If you go slow enough, it's fine. Just take your time. And it's like that's the stuff that's going on in my head. And then I bring that back into the real world where it's like those things that I think about, those motivating, you know, talks that I have in my brain are the motivating talks that I need in the real world to keep doing what I'm doing. So mm. it's just incredibly therapeutic and a lot of things just like happen and maybe it's because you're breathing the entire time and that's like a form of meditation you know you're just breathing you're breathing you have to breathe you know and you're forcing yourself to breathe and then it puts you into this meditative state you know there's so much about it that's just so good for you not just mentally but then physically you know you're breathing you're creating more alkaline in your blood and obviously that's very healing so there's just all these different things that I get to bring back with me and it's so, so helpful. So, you know, and then just the simplicity of all of it, you know, just saying to yourself, okay, food, I need to eat this thing, you know, in order to have enough calories and then have water, have these supplies. When you get back into the real world, you, you realize that it's that minimalism thought process. Hmm. That makes you kind of not care about all the other stuff that we end up thinking about when we're living in a city like Los Angeles or when you live in London. You're thinking about all these things that's just, you know, materialistic things. Hmm. And when you're out there in the wilderness walking and all you're thinking about is water and food and shelter, all those things are so not important. And that's the the stuff I get to bring back, all those, you know, things that are important. Yeah. I guess it's like a decluttering of your yes. space, of your mind and clearing out the bullshit for at yeah. least three to five days, isn't it? And yeah. I guess that's like a reset. Is that is that what it's like for you? Yeah, exactly. That's the word, decluttering. That's exactly mm the word I was probably looking for. It's just all of it. It just doesn't even matter. Who cares about a car? Who cares about like having this thing? And, 
these these materialistic things. You're thinking about food, water, and shelter. And that's like <laughs> the basic of human needs. Like you can survive on those things. So who cares about all the other stuff, the fancy stuff that we put so much pressure on ourselves to attain when we're in our yeah. real world? Yeah. Sometimes when we go on these types of treks and camping expeditions and experiences out in nature, that can be an uncomfortable living situation for some people, or at least less comfortable than the, uh. the creature comforts of home in our normal houses and our normal situations. What do you have to say about traveling in this way, as, a, you know, as opposed to going and staying in a hotel and relaxing on a beach in a resort or whatever? You like to go out and rough it? let's say, is this expression? Yes. Do you find that therapeutic as well, even though perhaps you might not get the best night's sleep? The decluttering of the mind and the breathing of fresh air is a nice off sort of balancing out. Well, there's always a time and place for luxury travel. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> so don't get me wrong. That's always really nice from time to time. But if somebody were to offer me, would you like this five-star hotel room for a day or would you like five days out in the wilderness or three days out in the wilderness? I'd 100% pick three days out in the wilderness. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, there's just, it's just so, even one day out in the wilderness, depending on where it is, beachfront property in Mexico or a night in the African safari, like oh, African safari, hello, <laughs> like there's no... <laughs> What do you mean? Like, that's amazing. Yes, I find that therapeutic. Also, I've gotten really, really good about the type of gear that I have that make it very comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. I, I get a good night's sleep. <laughs> Every time I'm out in the wilderness, I clonk out. It's probably the best sleep that I ever have because there's no hotel room noises. Every time I have to stay in a hotel for work or anything like that, it's very rare for me to go for for leisure. I find that to be so, I hear noises, I hear people, there's all this stuff that's going on. But when I'm out in the wilderness, there's nothing. Yeah. So to me, that's, that's when I get the best night's sleep, but it's only because I have the right gear. If you don't have the right yeah. gear, if you don't have a sleeping pad or a comfortable sleeping bag, that's rated for the temperature that you're going to, you're going to be uncomfortable because you don't have the right gear. But if you do it correctly, you're going to be fine. So. so investing some money in some quality gear will yeah. make your outdoors traveling far more comfortable than yes. it could be. Yes. <laughs> and you may spend, you know, it might be a big chunk of money, but I've had my sleeping bag. It's rated zero. It's a Marmot lithium. I've had that sleeping bag for over 10 years and that thing is still amazing. So it's you know, getting quality gear that lasts you for a really long time, it's totally worth it. And I don't see that thing going away. It's it feels like it's brand new. I'm just saying, get nice gear. <laughs> and then you'll it'll <laughs> last you forever. <laughs> it's your bed, you know? <laughs> no doubt. I am aware from listening to some of your podcasts, which we'll get to in a little bit, yeah. that you like to do a bit of mountain climbing in California as well. What is it about climbing mountains and summiting peaks that you find rewarding is it the physical challenge or is it something deeper than that it's both for sure it's the physical challenge can i make it up there i have a lot of knee issues mm. if you listen to my podcast sometimes people ask me you know dre you should go climbing with me and i'm like that's not possible because you're super fast and i'm so slow because of my knee issues which came from hiking <laughs> over hiking and injuring myself from running down a mountain oh <laughs> dear yeah, I ran down this. It's a long story. I ran down this mountain and it was uh, I had forgotten my headlamp. I was very young. And ever since then, I uh, I injured my knee. It's never been the same. And so for me, it's like taking my time is really important <laughs> so I can preserve my knees. But climbing a mountain is not just physical for me. It's definitely mental. And it's that going back to that thing again of reminding myself one foot in front of the other you know, you can make it if you go slow enough, everybody has to go at, it at their own pace and it's okay. You know, you just got to keep going and it's so rewarding. Like I look up at Mount Whitney, you know, every time I pass on the 395 and Mount Whitney is the highest mountain in the lower 48 states. I climbed that mountain and I remember just like being up there. I was so sick. I was so 
utterly just famished. I I was so awful. Like if you saw me, you thought I was going to die, you know? <laughs> but I got up there and it was the most you know, it was just so gratifying knowing that I did that. And then I came, I, I went up for like a second and they're like, do you want to take a, do you want to look over the ledge? And I was like, no, I got to get down. Bye. And I went down. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's the reminder that you can do many things if you just take your time. And then I'm able to bring those very important lessons back home when I'm climbing other types of mountains, which is, you know, work life, career. Mm family, I can bring those same lessons back home and remember, hey, you climb that mountain and you remember the things that you learned while you were doing that. It's hard. It's hard. It's not easy. Otherwise, everybody would do it. So you just keep going one foot in front of the other. And it's like I those lessons that I learn when I'm climbing is exactly what I need when I come back. Have there ever been any moments, Drea, when you've been out on trails or out camping under the stars or situations like this, where you've been scared, whether it's Maybe there's some wildlife that's a bit sketchy around the place. If maybe there's some bad weather coming, maybe due to your knees, you're you're not certain you're going to get back in time. Have you ever had this sort of fear when you've been out in the wilderness? I mean, I've definitely had some near death experiences. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I'm looking <laughs> I'm looking through my catalog of things that have happened. There's so many. There was one time a long time ago when I wasn't a very experienced hiker, I decided that I wanted to climb down the Grand Canyon. And I looked over the ledge and I said, I want to go down there by the river. So the next day we got up at seven in the morning and was like, we're going to go all the way down there. And there's all these signs like, don't go down to the river and back up in one day. People die. And I was like laughing. I was like, ha, ha, ha. I took like a photo next to it. I was maybe like 20 years old, like really just I've never hiked, like really hiked in my life. I think I had we had gone to Sedona then like two days before and I hiked for the first time in my life up to Bell Rock, which is like a nature walk. And I decided I was going to go down to the Grand Canyon and I went down there and I remember just grabbing bottles of water, not even having like appropriate, nothing. I had no idea, like no, no idea what it, what I needed, the gear that I needed, the stuff that I needed, hiking pole, none of that. Like there was, there was just so much ignorance. And I went all the way down laughing at those signs and then ate lunch in the Grand Canyon and then started walking up. And I was like, why are why are my legs giving out? My left leg, I couldn't feel it. It went numb. And there are signs on the bottom that say, if this happens to you, you don't have enough salt in your legs, so you have to lift your legs up. It like had signs of like, if this happens. So th I guess this is like normal. So I had to like lift my legs up above my head for the blood to rush back down for me to be able to walk. And I did this for I, for the entire time going up every couple of feet like maybe like every 20 feet I would have to sit down lift my legs up and I thought I was just gonna die on this I thought I was gonna die in the Grand Canyon I didn't want to carry anything I was gonna throw my camera off the cliff ledge and the person I was with was like don't do that you need that I was like I can't do this and I I thought I was gonna die <laughs> wow yeah so I think uh we got back there around like 10 o'clock so I had been hiking from 7 30 in the morning till 10 p.m at night and we didn't have enough food we didn't have enough water nothing it was so mm. dumb but I was also very inexperienced and so that was a lesson <laughs> that I learned and from then on I was fully prepared I had done my research and again it was at a time when there was none of that you couldn't look up that stuff easily you know so <laughs> Yeah, I think sometimes too, Dre, especially when you're young, it's a process of discovering your limits, isn't it? Because you yeah. obviously went into this Grand Canyon thinking, hell yeah, I'm going to smash this. And it almost smashed you, but you didn't die. And in the process, you kind of learned a lot more about yourself and your limitations and also how to be better prepared for future experiences like this. Yes, for sure. Yeah. I just remember getting up there 
and laying down, having somebody go get the car. And I was like, I just got to lay down. I laid at this bus stop (laughs) and it was freezing. It was freezing. And I was like, I'm freezing. And I'm like, my body won't shake. Like, you know, like your body's supposed to like shake when you're when you're trying to protect yourself from the cold to keep warm. And I was like, my body won't shake because I'm dying. And I was like, I don't have enough energy to shake my body. And I could barely walk like my whole I had just never experienced anything like that. And it was such a lesson. And oof, man, young and ignorant. <laughs> We've all been there, Treya. We've all yes. been there. <laughs> but yeah now i'm like okay i know what to do and then i can help people that are younger than me <laughs> so yeah have you ever had an issue like that before with your legs and not having enough salt in them i imagine that kind of thing only happens in really hot climates like you would get in the grand canyon where your legs just lose all the electrolytes and they start cramping up and you can't really use them properly that's never happened to you again never ever again like it never happened to me ever again. I've never experienced that. I've I've felt, you know, my legs being tired, my knees kind of being in pain or just feeling overall fatigue, but I've never felt what I felt in the Grand Canyon. But mind you, I had never hiked. Like I went to Bell Rock, like a half a mile hike up this little beautiful uh, little trail. And then I went to, I think the Bright Angel Trail is like 16 miles or something like that. Something crazy. Maybe I'm overshooting it, maybe 14 But my God, (laughs) holy moly, imagine I had never even done a mile of hiking. And this was one of the most difficult hikes because it's canyon hiking and canyon hiking is dangerous because you keep going down and you're thinking this is easy. Then you have to go back up. And when you start going back up, you don't realize how how difficult that is. The elevation change, you have no concept, especially for someone at the time. I had no idea, no idea. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> I had no idea elevation change. What's that? You know, didn't even think about that stuff. <laughs> With all your experiences exploring California, have you come across any interesting wildlife? Uh, in California, I mean, I've run into coyotes a lot. You know, I've done lots of hiking at night. Mm. Uh, I used to night hike all the time and then I would run into a coyote and they'd look at me and then I'd be like, what's up, coyote? And then they'd run away and then I'd... <laughs> You know, do a thing. Rattlesnakes. I've run into rattlesnakes. There was like a baby rattlesnake on at Griffith Park. I had to like hop over on this trail, which was incredibly dangerous, by the way. Like baby rattlesnakes can't control their poison if they bite you. So it's very dangerous. So I just was like, Ugh. Um, <laughs> but nothing like too crazy. Like I have never run into mountain lion. I've never run into bears here. I've definitely seen bears, you know, actually... Up in the sequoias, I've seen some bears, but never to the point of danger. So I've never run into anything like that. I've also never through hiked the PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail, which is when people really run into to some like animals. <laughs> yeah, I listened to one of your podcasts with a, a bloke talking about his experiences on the PCT. And <laughs> yeah, that was immense. Some of the stuff he was talking about on yeah. that for sure. <laughs> yeah, Great episode. Yeah, which one with Jeff or the one with Tim? Tim, Dutch guy. Yeah. The Dutch guy, yes. Yeah, yeah, interesting guy, interesting guy. Yeah, he's uh, he had some experiences. There was a new episode that came out with Jeff Garmeyer who had done the Triple Crown, which is the PCT, the Appalachian Trail, and the, the Continental Divide all in one year, which I think only 11 people have ever done. And he's had wow. some. Yeah, he's crazy. He's, he's like... um speed record holder it's uh he's he's had some weird experiences with (laughs) bears and lions and mountain lions and moose i think not not mountain lions moose so it's just that's a good one (laughs) (laughs) there's a quote that people often throw around with traveling and it's it's not about the destination but the journey what's your thought on on that quote to to be honest, I actually have mixed feelings about that quote. <laughs> Explain. Ex- I'm explaining. I'm explaining. I love <laughs> the like the the hike up, you know, a mountain. It's amazing. You get to experience this whole thing. But man, that destination sometimes is incredible too. And I think people want to say that. I don't know. I have these like mixed feelings about it. Like it's like very clear I do because yes, I love the like the the hiking and the journey and like okay, this is part of it. 
but sometimes the destination is really rewarding too and we can't forget that you know that's the final goal so for me it's this you know it's a mix of the two worlds and I think enjoying both to its fullest extent is important not like mm. not forgetting that this destination is badass and that's the whole reason why you're going there but then also that journey is pretty amazing too and so I think having that balance remembering that those two exist together and that they're simultaneously part of the whole thing because I think a lot of times people say that and they go oh it's about it's a, it is about the journey not the destination I'm like no it's not true that's right <laughs> you know it's a little bit of both, you know, and remembering that those two go hand in hand and then not to forget to celebrate that destination because you worked really hard for it. So, yeah, you would requote. It's both about the journey and the destination. Exactly. Exactly. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think about that often. And I'm like, man, the destination is pretty amazing. I'm on this mountain. It's incredible. And I worked my ass off for it. And that's that's pretty cool to just always reflect on it and then reward yourself. Like that's such a huge reward when you get to whatever that is. If it's not a, not just a mountain, but whatever that goal is in your life, if you've reached your, you know, pinnacle of your career or you worked hard for this for you, a screenplay that you've wanted to get done out there. And maybe it's like the director you wanted or the actors that you wanted. That's amazing. And yes, all this stuff mattered, you know, all of it mattered too. But man, celebrate. The destination because that's amazing <laughs> don't forget to do that speaking of journeys and destinations Drea, i was wondering if you have a favorite journey and destination and not necessarily for the same trip but perhaps is there a, a vista when you've summited a mountain that is like the number one view you've ever seen or is there a journey that you remember as being your most rewarding journey from all your traveling and trekking experiences I have two. Do you want the international one or you want one that's like the pr most beautiful place? I don't know. <sighs> Give us both, Joe. Okay. So my favorite two destinations that were incredibly rewarding and hard. A day hike that I did recently up in Wyoming to Delta Lake uh, in uh, the Grand Tetons. That was so beautiful. It was so incredible. It had, it had been on my bucket list for so long. And that's what the pandemic really rewarded me. Instead of me going outside of the country, I went to explore what was within the states. And I went to Wyoming for the first time in Montana and Idaho. And it was amazing. But that hike was very hard, partly because I broke my fifth metatarsal and I decided that I was going to go climb it anyway like I was like I only you know that was like five weeks ago I probably shouldn't be hiking this pretty difficult hard hike this you know that goes straight up rock scrambling etc cetera, etc cetera. and I did it anyway because I needed to it was on my bucket list I was going to do it but the reward it was so incredible and it was difficult because there the last part of it is very slippery and dangerous there was somebody at the top of it a young girl that had sprained her foot at the very top of it and i was like i don't even know how she's gonna get down because it's so hard so that was a, the, my most recent difficult hike that was a difficult day hike and then <laughs> the other one is machu picchu in peru but i had done the salkantai trek <laughs> and the salkantai trek is very high it's 15,500 feet that you're going to go through this pass next to Mount Salkantai. And at the time, I had never done any high elevation hiking. I, I, I haven't even done anything close to that outside of Mount Whitney. Those are the two. And 15.5 is on another level. That just feels like your body is just like shutting down. And I, I've said this before on my podcast where I've said, I really feel like I was born on an island at those elevations because I know my body is like, what are you doing up here? You belong in the Philippines on an island. Like, what are you doing at 15.5? You, you don't belong up here. Your body isn't built for this. And I feel it at that elevation. I thought, again, I was going to die. And my tour guide was like, you need to turn around. And I was like, I will not turn around. I will keep going. <laughs> like, it's going to take me forever. I'm going to just keep going. But that, it was incredibly rewarding because there were... I mean, there were many times when they were t trying to tell me to turn around and I, I refused. And so I just 
you know, went slow and they they helped me out. And I knew that once we reached that pass that we would descend down 4,000 feet and that was going to make a huge difference. And then it was easy breezy from there. I felt like superwoman because <laughs> uh, I got all my my hunger was back. Like if you've ever experienced elevation sickness, once you descend, it just feels like you're normal. Like you just start feeling like oh, like I can drink water without wanting to throw up or like any, like it could eat food again and you just feel so powerful and you have this like high, like your whole body is like very capable of just speeding through everything. That was definitely rewarding. And then I remember just like walking up to Machu Picchu and knowing how hard I had, I had worked for it. Uh, and it was very, very rewarding. And I just enjoyed and like got to like walk around this place that I had dreamed of my entire life to go to. So, yeah, it seems like you have a history of <laughs> throwing yourself into difficult situations, diving into the deep end, and I guess pushing the levels of your comfort zone. Have you always been like this? And do you feel that that's one way of you really growing into the best version of yourself? Yeah, I think I've always had that like need to do that where I just kind of throw myself into a situation and either learn it or you know like fail at it or really just when it comes to mountain climbing taking my time and not caring you know what else what what whatever else anyone else is doing <laughs> if I said that right <laughs> I just kind of do my own thing and not really care and maybe it's very hard but I just I've always had that and I've always had this thing where I would look up at a mountain even at a young age nobody is nobody in my family are mountain climbers or outdoorsy people and I would just want to climb it mm -hmm. so I've just always had that thing in my head and I think as far as it transcending into my career I've always done the same thing where I wanted something and then I would just say I'm gonna go do that thing and I'm just gonna learn it you know, throw yourself in the deep end. That's Perfect. just, I think I've just had that. <laughs> You're not afraid. No, no, I don't think I've ever been afraid. Maybe through time, as I get older, I'm starting to have these like fears, right? It's weird because I didn't have those fears. I was just talking to somebody about it today. How when you're young, you're com I was like completely fearless when I was young. I did not care. I would do things and I'd be like, I need to go up on that stage and do this thing. Like, I don't really care. Like, no thought. And I would just go. Um, no preparation, nothing. And I think over time you start learning and uh, learning more fears. And so it's a little different now. I definitely have more fears, even about hiking. I definitely think about things differently, less fearless. Mm. I think maybe finding a balance is a good thing. I don't know. I think you're, you're right in that regard because everybody has – a balance within their own minds of the risk versus reward when it comes to any situation. And I think as we grow and we change throughout our whole lives, the risk and reward ratios can shift depending on the situation we're in right now or where we're headed or what's going on in our lives. And even for you, with your hiking and camping in the wilderness and even with career work and stuff that goes on in Los Angeles – the risk and reward can change, can't it? Yeah, it definitely can. It definitely can. And it's like I'm an actor, you know? There's been so, I mean, you got to live your life with rejection. You yeah. know, lots and lots and lots of rejection. You got to get used to it. But after a while, you start having these like fears, you know? As an adult, you start like learning all these fears. And then I'm like, I didn't used to have that. I need to cut that out, you know? And like, who cares? Um, so it's trying to find that balance of risk and reward, like you said, um, with, with specific things too, but also remembering maybe you need to be, you know, you need to go back to the younger you sometimes and not really care. Yeah. There's something in that. There's something. Finding in that. the balance yeah. is tricky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drea, in California specifically, and with all your different trips that you've had around the state, if somebody wanted to go on a hike, would there be a specific trail that you would recommend to them? Let's say a beginner to moderate level hiker. Like day hike or like several? Yeah, days? like a day hike. Yeah. Hmm. Or a couple of days. I would say I really love this recent 
hike that I did up in the Sierras by Bishop. It's called Treasure Lakes. And that was beautiful. I did that before it got too cold to go up there. And I've been trying to look for new places to hike that a lot of people don't know about. Treasure Lake was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, you start in Lake Sabrina and you rise above this lake and then you end up finding this alpine lake out of nowhere. And it's just incredible. It just doesn't even, it, I can't even explain it because it just doesn't even look real. And there are these crags and it's just so beautiful. I love, love that hike so much. And that's a pretty easy day hike. Not easy, but moderately difficult. You know, you just have to take your time. And how far away from LA? Oh, <laughs> that's like a six hour drive from LA. If you're talking about okay. LA, if you're coming to LA, I would say uh, a really beautiful hike that's like 30 minutes from LA is Chantry Flats to Sturvesant Falls. There are these waterfalls that are in the mountains here that overlook LA, not the hills, but the big mountains with the snow. You go there and you can go down to this beautiful, I think it's like a 60 foot waterfall. I think 60, something like that. Uh, don't quote me on that. But yeah, it's like, it just <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's so beautiful. And you do all these like crossings and you go into a canyon, you do canyon hiking, which is descending down. It's not too difficult. I discovered that trail because when I was doing my documentary about 11 blind hikers summoning Mount Baldy, Baldy for the Blind, I don't know if you know that I'm I've doing I've seen it on their websites, yeah. Yeah, so that that was their first training hike. So it's uh -huh. a 500-foot elevation gain and loss, and that's a pretty easy, you know, doable hike for anyone. And it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's gorgeous. The most important thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> My favorite four. Okay, got some good questions here. Don't think about them too much. Just okay. uh, come up with an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Drea. Question one What is your favorite transportation? Hmm. Oh, God. Jet ski. Ooh, haven't had that one. <laughs> really? Not yet. You're the first person to say jet ski. Nice one. So fun. Yeah, I believe you. <laughs> what is your favorite souvenir? Um, like a local art, like local, local like potter, like something like made locally. I don't know if that's a good. <laughs> that you'd buy at the market and bring yeah. back home with you. Yeah, local handcrafted things, <laughs> whatever that is. Drea, do you have a favorite geographical landmark? Probably Machu Picchu. Is that what you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the last question, what's your favorite continent? Gosh, probably South America. Well, that's where Machu Picchu is. So exactly. Yeah, that makes that's sense. Why. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> well, there you go. My favorite four. I'd like to talk a little bit about your podcast, Drea. It's called Roaming the Earth. And it's a little similar to The Nostalgic Vagabond in the sense that you like to have conversations with other people, other travelers, and about their their journeys across the world. So could you tell me, why did you decide to start the podcast Roaming the Earth? I broke my foot. <laughs> I had mentioned that I broke my fifth metatarsal. <laughs> right. So I couldn't travel. And I was going crazy because I'm all fidgety and I couldn't do anything and we're in the middle of the pandemic. So I thought, A, I wanted to connect with other people and that was a way to meet other people and learn from them. And I could live vicariously through their travels and then start making a list of places that I wanted to go to and nerd out on their experiences. So honestly, it was a selfish reason of maybe through these people, I could find out where to go next. I can make these awesome connections and feel like I'm part of this community. I wanted to create a community of people that, you know, love to do the same things I love to do and have this similar, similar passion for travel. Mm. So you've been able to, during the pandemic, actually connect with people virtually via Zoom, like we're doing now. Yes. Talk about travel learn about new places you might not have thought about before so you could decide perhaps where to go next. Yes. Have you decided where or 
which places you want to go to next. Yes. I want to go to Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, which was actually places that I wanted to go to before. Now talking to other people, it really solidified those things. And, you know, I really want to do the PCT, at least part of it. You know, that's one one in like one thing that inspired me talking to different people on my podcast so now i'm like ooh, i could i could do it i could do at least a portion yeah so yeah <laughs> nice now when you say tanzania and kenya and places like this i imagine it was always on the list but has it been bumped higher up the list in recent times it was a place i was supposed to go to go during the pandemic like it got canceled so it was definitely already on the top of my list. But then talking to someone on my podcast really, really solidified that. And, you know, now I'm looking at other surrounding countries like Ethiopia and other, you know, I ended up looking at Uganda because of it. That wasn't on the list. I was only supposed to go to Tanzania and, and Kenya. But now I'm like, well, I could go to Ethiopia or something like that. Like I started looking at other options and it might change. Who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> the more people you interview on your podcast, the more countries will get added to that part of Africa. So it'll end up being a massive six-month trip. I know. I know. It's so bad. <laughs> now I'm looking at Sval Sol Salzbard. Like, I'm like, I've never heard of Salzbard. Now I'm looking at Salzbard and I'm looking at Greenland and yeah. all these places I've never even uh, thought about wasn't on my radar. <laughs> yeah. Where can listeners find more information about you and your podcasts? So you can find my website for the podcast on roamingtheearthpodcast.com or you can find uh, my podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio or um, Amazon. Uh, it's all over the place. Just look for Roaming the Earth and, and you should be able to to check me out. <laughs> cool. And do you have any social media platforms that you use in conjunction with the, the website? I do. My social media, my Instagram is at I'm roaming the earth. Brilliant. <laughs> so Instagram.com slash I'm roaming the earth. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation talking with you about outdoor adventures and pushing your comfort zones and exploring California and surrounds. So a big thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your time and having a chat with me. And yeah, I wish you all the best in California with the current issues with COVID and the pandemic and with your career and also hoping that you can escape again and discover more nature places in the future. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Nostalgic Vagabond. I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation. And if you would like to listen to other interesting talks on travel, there are more podcasts available. Check them out wherever you get your podcasts. And for updates, just follow me at The Nostalgic V. Don't forget, your journey is special. Own it. I've been Alan Hill. Until next time. Hey guys, if you enjoy listening to The Nostalgic Vagabond, why not support the podcast? If you haven't already, subscribe and you'll be notified when new apps drop. You can also support the podcast by leaving a rating or a review on your podcast app. Why not share this episode? Tell your friends about it if something resonated with you. Word of mouth is great promotion. If you're into social media, maybe post a screenshot of the episode or upload the link on your profile so your mates can see what interesting content you've been into lately. All your support comes straight back and helps to keep the travel content and nostalgia of this podcast going. Cheers. So don't forget to subscribe.